Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this AIS webinar. Um, our inaugural webinar series last November was received well enough to encourage us to organize this second series, second series uh, on gearing up for advanced air mobility, where our intention is on getting an update on what is happening in the global industry and what's happening, uh, what's, what, what the global industry is doing and what this could mean for us in Singapore. This morning, we have got two eminent speakers, um, both of whom are no strangers to AAIS and webinars. Mike Daniels is a fellow member of the AAIS panel of experts and is MD at Aviation Insight. He has more than 34 years of experience in civil aviation safety and regulatory oversight having been involved in a senior capacity in the US FAA, as well as ICAO. We also have Prof. James Wang, who is Director of NTU's eVTOL Research and Innovation Center, with a distinguished academic background from MIT and University of Maryland. He has been described by Wired Magazine as the Steve Jobs of Rotocraft. So we've got a pretty distinguished panel today. Let me not take up any more time than necessary and let me pass the session over to Mike, Mike Daniels, for his presentation on airworthiness considerations for advanced air mobility. Okay, great, uh, Robin. Okay, well, I do think this is a special privilege to, to be able to present on this topic for AEIS and, and our community here. Uh, I do also believe that uh, we're still in the pioneer phase of, of uh, the, the you know, advent of uh, advanced air mobility uh, remote piloted uh, vehicles. And so for a right frame of reference, uh, I'm going to define uh, some of the uh, items that we're going to be talking about today so that we have a reference to, uh, to knowing the context where we'll be coming from today. Okay, so current state versus uh, future, future state. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what it is like today. And, uh, and then we have to start thinking about ev uh, evolving into the future. And we really need to be mindful of systems thinking and systems engineering. There's so many dynamics changing now <clears throat> in, with this uh, new technologies coming online. Uh, some of these technologies have already been online, but we keep uh, getting better and better, especially on the design part of it. And now it's in the interface that may be of more uh, concern, and you'll see the reasons why. I'll talk about uh, the big picture first, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the ICAO standards. I've got uh, some uh, nice announcements, announcements to make with regard to the ICAO uh, movement for international standards and recommended practices. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what the FAA is doing currently as well as EASA, and I think I even have a slide on the CAC China as well. I'll wrap up the discussion this morning uh, with regard to safety management and uh, risk management, which is also should be built into the design standards. Okay, so what is advanced air mobility? Uh, builds upon the uh, urban air mobility and, and then how we move things, move commerce around, move people around. So that's, that's really where we're coming from in today's discussion. So again, we have to be mindful of the new systems that are coming online and coming in, pl in place here. Uh, we have to develop the public confidence, public trust in what we're doing in order to continue on with the remarkable safety record that we have in aviation today. Okay, so this is an important uh, uh, definition that we do need to keep in mind. What is remotely piloted aircraft systems? So we talk about the drones and uh, UAS and manned aerial systems, and but let's just stay with the lexicon of the of, uh, and taxonomy of ICAO for a while. So what is remotely piloted aircraft systems? It's associated remote pilot stations, and that's a key word, the required command and control links and any other components that's specified in the type design. So now that we're introducing new concepts, of what conventionally we were used to talking about type design. Now we're now we're inclusive more interface uh, systems, in particular the stations and flying from other areas, at in for the aircraft that will be flying. Okay, what is type certificate? 
a document issued by a contracting state to define the design of an aircraft type and to certify that this design meets the appropriate airworthiness requirements of that state. So it's very crucial now that we understand that when a type certificate is issued by a country, a state member state of the ITAO uh, Chicago Convention, that it meets some form of type design. And this is the fast pace right now that we're seeing is the evolution of what type design really means. So, and I'll get into the to more detail here in, in a second on that. Okay, airworthiness standards. So I was asked to present on what airworthiness means. Airworthiness standards detailed and comprehensive design and safety criteria applicable to the category of the aeronautical product, aeronautical product, the aircraft, engine, propeller, that satisfy as a minimum the applicable standards of Annex 8. Annex 8 from ICAO does prescribe the processes for aircraft certification, as well as the type design, as well as the type certificate. And this is what we need to be mindful of the big picture of what is what we're doing globally so that we can harmonize perhaps. And it's really important on the safety part of the equation. Okay, so it's no big secret uh, why there's so much interest in uh, air mobility, advanced air mobility is because the environment, the congestion, we know that, the price of oil it goes quite high, fluctuates crazy. And so now that we're taking the opportunity to look at other modes of, of uh, propelling aircraft, whether it's electronically or electrically, or uh, even hydrogen in some cases. Okay, um, just in terms of concept, the challenge of building the roads in the skies, because the theme of my discussion is the expansion of what airworthiness standards is. And this is an important concept to keep in mind, the expansion of what airworthiness means. So we have to now include unmanned air, uh, uh, the vehicles, the air traffic and management, uh, compliance with the airspace regulation, separation, route planning and rerouting, um, sequencing and spacing, dynamic geofencing, terrain avoidance, I mean, there's, a, there's quite a few items that we have to consider for airspace management. Those vehicles flying in airspace management, whether it's national or transnational or, or international, have to keep these in mind. And this is where we're seeing the evolution of what airworthiness means, because it will include equipage and the software to deal with these different factors. Okay, so ICAO, the National Civil Aviation Organization, has issued a manual on remotely piloted aircraft systems. And what we what we don't have now, though, <clears throat> is the on the commercial transportation side. So when we move from the design and certification into transportation, what are the licensing requirements in order to do that in a safe and effective manner? So ICAO. Uh, the RPAS components, and um, if you could see me hovering here, so I'm going to be coming back to the slide later on, but again, we have to start thinking airworthiness now is much broader than just the aircraft. It's just the systems way of thinking and systems interface, and that is so crucial, crucial for successful and safe operations. Okay, uh, just for terms of reference too, piloted aircraft, uh, pilotless aircraft, no uh, aircraft capable of being flown without a pilot shall be flown with a, a pilot over the territory of a state with that special authorization of that state in accordance with the terms of such authorization. So this is the purpose of ICAO, international operations. So, so when we start looking at aircraft, that's not only just flying within this, the state or the country, and, uh, but you have to be mindful of the international airspace because all these uh, aircraft have to be flying together friendly in a safe manner. So this is why ICAO is really keen on systems management, airspace management. We just want to make sure we do it in safe and, uh, and risk, less risk management behavior to obviate any danger. Let's get this slide. So let me get into the, the good news now. So uh, ICAO announced in March of this year, March 1st, that the ICAO Council has approved the new changes and the amended changes to Annex 8 of the, of the International Civil Aviation Organization standards for airworthiness. 
And that's what I'm really happy to, to say is that now we're starting to see the framework develop at the global view, which helps enable us, enable us at the regulatory view of developing those standards and practices to meet international requirements. And so this, uh, this announcement here tells us that the, uh, the new provisions for Annex 8 uh, have been adopted by the Council. Uh, the, uh, I do have a copy of the advanced um, type design, if you will, uh, of the airworthiness requirements. And we have to take note here that the, the new provisions take effect July 2021, but be applicable in, in year 2026. So there's going to be at least, what, five years now to start slowly implementing these new type design changes in with regard to what airworthiness means. Okay, so uh, again, Annex 8, um, circling around the airworthiness, that's the primary change, the evolution of what air, airworthiness means. But we also have to be mindful of the interface and interrelationship with other regulations, primarily those of airspace management, uh, re registration, licensing, uh, licensing of the people flying the vehicles, whether it's autonomous or not, there's still going to be persons involved with that with that uh, flying portion of it. Uh, C2 Link, this is uh, one of the new concepts that we'll be developing for the air awareness standard. And I'll come back to that point on what C2 Link is. Okay, so current state. This is just a, uh, just a uh, quick picture of what the conventional state of mind is, state of uh, certification is for the FAA. Yes, it is somewhat similar. If we can observe on the slide here, part 21, that's the primary certification rule for everything aircraft. And then if you observe on the left-hand side, there's several numbers over here, 25, 23, 27. Those are the type design code for airplanes, aircraft, um, on balloons, engines. So that's what we have today. That That is the type design. So if that's the case, then where does drones and RPS fall into? How are they how are they going to be fitting into this conventional system? Well, on the FAA side, in the operational world, there is a regulation, it's 107, that does allow for private operation of unmanned aerial vehicles. So that's in effect today, that's in use now. And so we that's a, it's a great lead for uh, several other countries as well as we start moving from private operations into commercial operations. And if you see where I'm circling around now, 135 is the rule for air taxi operations. So this, all this is changing. This is the conventional way. And how do we adapt these rules into a future state? Okay. So this is, the, the FAA way of dealing with it, uh, a few years ago, not that long ago, there's a, a very interesting change to Part 21. It's uh, Part 21.17, if you can see on, on your screen there, where this is where the FAA can prescribe special conditions uh, to, to certifying aircraft. And we see this being used quite often now, more and more often, uh, the use of special conditions, because why? The, the fluctuation of the type design is changing so much. Now the, the regulatory authorities, FAA, EASA, are using this, this, uh, uh, this concept of issuing special conditions. And that way they can establish the special type design criteria, functionality of the design, as well as the testing requirements. Uh, one classic example, batteries, if you recall, the lithium batteries on the 77 and 8th and the Airbus 350, those batteries were certified primarily through the use of special conditions. And we need to understand that concept. The other concept is that uh, for, since we do have a, a fluctuation and, and a hybrid of now regula regulations, the uh, FAA in this case can issue special regulations as a hybrid combining some portions of part 23, small aircraft, or small, uh, part 27, small helicopters, into a hybrid regulation as a type design. And this that's going to be the, the foothold of developing the 
autonomous vehicles or remote piloted vehicles. This is a very important rule to, to know and understand. Okay, so, uh, recent announcements. Uh, this one is uh, General Atomics. Uh, if you can see here on the slide, the FAA in this path has chosen a experimental certificate to do its research and design certification. So in this case, issuing a uh, an experimental certificate, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a type design. It's just the way the FAA is evolving the, the design of these aircraft into and into a more of a type design type certificate concept. So uh, primarily a lot of these aircraft, because of their size, speed, and altitude are issued experimental certificates, certificates, and they and these and that will fly in special airspace uh, within the United States. So let's take a look at the assets. So they recently announced a, a special condition of issuing a type certificate data sheet. So the the conventional type certificate data sheet was built on previous regulations 23, 25, 27, 29, but now we're starting to see again the movement of special conditions as part of the type certificate. So that, that way the authorities can try to keep up with the technological change and try to pre prescribe the framework for the type design testing and uh, uh, design testing. So the very important and this in this case, this type certificate applied to a light sport class of aircraft, small, but it uses a special type of electric hybrid propulsion engine. Okay, and again, using special conditions as part of that, <clears throat> as part of that design and certification. Okay, let me just keep moving on here. Okay, special condition is an example of so-called hereafter, which would provide or pr produce lift thrust power for flight. So these special conditions are really important. So what, what do you do? You have your teams of experts, engineers, uh, systems engineers, and they get together and agree upon this special condition platform so in order to help facilitate the, the manufacturing production of these aircraft, whether it's manned or unmanned aircraft. Again, this is one avenue of type design, including special conditions. Okay, recently, um, very recently in China, so they have a, announced a meeting of one of their manufacturers of where they agree to put together a, a, a process of type certification. Now they haven't issued the type certificate, but they will. Um, and, and so this, when you look at the, if you look at this as a race between the authorities, FAES, SCAC, Singapore, it, it's, it really is a race. Who's going to be out there in front designing the best, safest product for, for flying these type of vehicles? Okay, one thing that's not mentioned, and, and uh, this is what I think uh, is important to highlight, is cybersecurity. So when we look at the software and computer systems these days, I think eventually you're, we're going to have to have a standard in aviation that deals ex specifically on cybersecurity. Now, in the United States, there is standards for cybersecurity. Those can be adopted for the design uh, of, for the uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. And uh, so that's just out there. Uh, the framework includes how to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover this, the, as a framework core for the cybersecurity for that aircraft and operation. So eventually this will become its own uh, aviation standard, I'm sure of it. Okay, um, now coming up to the conclusion here. So we have all these annexes uh, issued by ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization. But the, the one that we have to be uh, very mindful of is the standard for safety management systems. Because when we're looking at developing now airworthiness and how we're looking at airworthiness, it truly has to be uh, more of a systems thinking as well as how to mitigate those risk factors. And so all regulators will be looking at risk management safety management systems as part of its design and testing as well as certification uh, requirements. So the, 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 the announcement by CAL when we look at the change of Annex 8 will include C2 link. 
satellite link, line to line, as part of airworthiness. And that's the probably the most important takeaway from this presentation is the evolution of what airworthiness means internationally and the in now introduction of this as part of the type design airworthiness. So let's look at it from an equation uh, point of view for public confidence. So we have the design, the functionality developed, plus our <clears throat> testing requirements. Uh, we, we have to have pretty rigid testing requirements to ensure we're meeting what the design is telling us, ultimately leading to the aircraft certification. And then we, we certify the aircraft. Then we have also now to the considerations of the registration requirements, the air operator, when we get into commercial operations, economic authority, that's all in the next phase after the aircraft certification. And again, when we're developing these products, we need to think even beyond the certification into the operation world. All this comes to public safety and confidence based on safety management systems, risk management, heavy, heavy, heavy on data. And data will be uh, extremely important in determining the, um, the, the risk and, and areas of risk. And I think that pretty much concludes my uh, presentation, Robin. Thank you, Mike. Okay. That was a very uh, information packed and uh, illuminating presentation. Uh, let me pass the session over to our next presenter, Prof. James Wang, whose topic is what to consider when designing an EV tall aircraft for certification. Over to you, Prof. Okay. Thank you very much, Robin. Can you hear me clearly, Robin? Yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, my topic will be to discuss what to consider when we want to design an eVTOL aircraft for certification. I'll do this from the perspective of a uh, aircraft designer because I have been working in the aircraft uh, industry for 30 years. So I have worked on over uh, 20 different uh, rotorcrafts back in the Sikorsky aircraft and also at Leonardo helicopters. So let me go through some of the caveats and consideration when we want to design a brand new eVTOL aircraft. Okay, first let me start with some historical uh, trend. What I'm showing on this chart is shows the, um, what are some of the new experimental eVTOL, air, the VTOL, vertical takeoff aircraft development over the last 100 years, from 1920 all the way to 2020. So every one of this uh, little bar or little words represent it one experimental vertical takeoff aircraft. We can see it started back from 1920s and 30s. That was when Igor Stokorsky invented the helicopters. And then from 1940 to 1970, we saw a rapid growth. There are many uh, new veto aircraft experimentations. And then we reach a slow period from 1970 to 2010. But suddenly by 20, 2010, in the last one decade, we see exponential growth in the uh, eVTOL aircraft. Most of this exponential growth are in the electric VTOL aircraft category. Okay. And these are, this chart shows a number of startups, NOEM, and groups that are working currently around the world in eVTOL research and development. So back in May 2015, there are almost uh, very little, less than 10 uh, groups working on eVTOL aircraft. And then by about 2018, 2017, that's when we see suddenly it started growing. That was when a company like Airbus and Boeing started getting in. And company like Joby, they actually started earlier back in the 2012. And then I also started working on eVTOL aircraft back in 2010. Uh, and then recently, the last two years, we see a lot of growth in eVTOL companies like Archer, and we see Lilium, and many other companies. So today there are over 300 startups working on eVTOL aircraft. Majority of these groups are still in the preliminary design phase. 
very, very few of them are in the certification stage. I mean, they're still thinking, they're still coming up with their concept. And none of these companies have received the type certificate yet from the FAA or EASA. So why is there suddenly we see the growing trend of hundreds of eVTOL companies in the last few years? Well, it's because we, in recent years, we see there's a, a lot of technology enablers, including more powerful electric motors. We see new silicon carbide inverters, which are mostly due to the uh, electric vehicle industry to help promote that. And we see much better rechargeable batteries that can have two, three times the specific energy of previous generation nickel cadmium or lead acid battery. We also see lower cost sensors. We see developing fly-by-wires, autonomous flight control, a lot of autonomous sensor and LiDAR equipment from the uh, autonomous car and vehicle sector. And we start seeing lighter weight composite structure and distributed propulsion architecture. Means with electric, we can easily mount the battery motors anywhere we like. We're not limited to the mechanical connection. And also see a lot of better computation tools, analysis, use CFDs to analyze these air vehicles. However, majority of these enablers have never been used or before have been certified on any production civil aircraft for power flying. Even though we have better electric motor, but really we have never certified any electric motors for electric fly, okay? So if we cannot say, yes, I can just go to the store and go to some company. Yes, can I place an order for electric motor that's been certified? That doesn't exist. Silicon carbide inverter, they may be very popular for cars. I mean, but we do not have silicon carbide inverter that prevalent yet has been used on many civil aircraft. Rechargeable battery, same thing. Even though we have used lithium battery like um, commercial airliner for, for usage in uh, avionics and other purposes, but we have not certified any aircraft using the uh, lithium battery purely for the purpose of flying. Okay, uh, fly-by-wire, there's not been any civil rotorcraft certified with fly-by-wire yet, and we have not had any aircraft with distributed electric propulsion certified yet. And these are some of the top runners today. We see they're coming from uh, mostly from Europe and also uh, North America. We see Lilium from Germany, Volocopter from Germany, Airbus from France, Hyundai from Korea, Bell Nexus from US, Joby from US, Ehan from China, Beta Technology from the US, Cora, Whisk uh, from US, and Vertical Aerospace from the UK. This is a chart published originally by Morgan Stanley back in 2018. They're trying to predict what is the human adaptation curve what looks like? How soon can we have urban air mobility? So back, their prediction was by 2010 to 2020, that was when this, there are many stealth prototype development. That was when Volocopters, Lilium, Joby, uh, and myself, we all started designing eVTOL aircraft. Today, we're in the second stage from 2020 to 2025. We have a lot of proof of concept eVTOL flying. We can see the regulatory engagement from FAA, EASA, even from Singapore, CAS is engaging. The stage three will be coming soon, which is from 2025 to 2030. We will see some initial op uh, operation and short range deployment of this electric vehicle short range because today's battery technology only allows you to fly for 20 minutes at the most. And I believe in my green comments that about one dozen cities around the world will probably start operating urban air mobility with EVTOL by 2025 to 2030. And by 2030 to 2040, I predict there will be about 100 cities around the world start operating uh, UAM, electric VTOL. By 2040, there'll be a large scale deployment. And Morgan Stanley predicts the whole market will reach US $1.5 trillion annually. So currently there's a global race for certification around the world. 
It started back in 2017 when US, the FA, they amend their uh, part 23 and to accommodate for urban air mobility. That was a lot of push by the uh, Uber. And then in May 2018, the UK Civil Aviation Authority, they granted the first uh, uh, flight test permission to a British company, the Vertical Aerospace. And China joined in 2019, the CAS, by issuing guidance on unmanned air vehicle operation. And then Ihang received the authorization from China to flight test at Ihang 180. And Europe really got into the gear around 2019. They published a special condition for eVTOL aircraft for up to 3.125 ton, that means 3,125 kilograms. And Singapore, right here, uh, we also last two years ago, 2019, October, CAS granted the permission to allow Volocopter to uh, do a demo right near Marina Sand. And Volocopter received the, their design organization approval from YASA at the same year, 2019. 2021, this year, FAA, Jay J. Merkel, the head of the FAA US integration team, he announced and he predicts in this year we'll probably see a electric or air mobility vehicle get certified. But he doesn't say what type or what company yet. Most likely, I think probably an electric airplane, not a vertical takeoff aircraft yet. 2024, Paris already staked out. They want to be the world's first city to have eVTOL operating uh, in air taxi basis, and they want to demonstrate during the Olympics time. So let's take a look what some of the popular architecture for eVTOL aircraft. On the pile left side, majority, 42% of the eVTOL aircraft, the multi-rotor type, because they're simpler to design, simpler to build. They're basically like a large drone type of uh, uh, vehicle. And then the 15% are liftless crews. Liftless crews is also slightly simpler than the other design because you have separate propeller or rotor for lifting the rope helicopter or aircraft into vertical flight. And then once you get the altitude, you turn the rear propeller and you propel forward. So there's a separate lifting, separate cruise propulsion system. That's simplified it. Then we see about 8% of the design around the world, electric helicopter and gyrocopter. Uh, the John Air Mobility is one of those. And it's not as popular, this category, because uh, people in general do not feel it as innovative or game-changing because you still see the big rotor like a helicopter. Now, 35% of design are what we call vector thrust. The vector thrust can be separate into a tilt rotor type, which is, or a tilt wing. The tilt wing is shown at the bottom like, like the Airbus Fahana. The entire wing can tilt to vector the thrust. The tilt rotor is like what we know about V22, the A609, or the Joby. Only the rotor tilt to uh, provide the both lifting and cruising. The vector thrust is probably the most uh, efficient into aerodynamics. Now, I uh, mentioned this before. So FAA expects they will type cert certify an advanced air mobility aircraft sometime this year. And this is actually exact quote, based on where we see the project, probably our first urban or advanced air mobility aircraft will get certified happen in 2021 and probably with two or three other falling right behind them, okay? So they really, the FAA want to start an operation by 2023 and then really begin commercial for fee surface around 2024. But FAA did not say this is gonna be a vertical takeoff aircraft or just an electric airplane. FAA also says in terms of advanced air mobility, we are viewing these aircraft as the same level of safety of any other passenger aircraft or any other manned aviation. We believe the societal expectation for these aircraft that they will operate like any other Part 21 or Part 23 was the Part 91 operations. So let's take a look. What is this 23, 25, 21, 27, 29, all these? Okay. So what we on the left side, we see usually we certify airplane that have to follow either Part 23 or 25. 
The difference, part 23 means the aircraft will weight under 12,500 pounds and have less than nine passengers. Part 25 is for bigger aircraft, like even like Airbus or Boeing type commercial aircraft were greater than 12,500 pounds. Part 27 and 29 are for rotorcraft, means helicopter, traditional certification. For part 27, they're used for certifying helicopters under 7,000 pounds. Part 29 is for bigger helicopter over 7,000 pounds. So how does the eVTOL fit in all this? So right now, currently the trend is that the eVTOL uh, will most likely fit under the 7,000 pound category. And it will also be using the ruling with a combination, some of the rule from the 23 and some of it from the 27. This is also the, the, the tactic that the YASA is adapting. Okay, now let's take a look. What is the life of a typical helicopter program to get from concept all the way to certification and delivery? Usually it takes about one year to do a conceptual design, another year to do a preliminary design, two years to do a detailed design, one year to do a fatigue wind tunnel test, one year to do a ground vehicle test, we also call that Ironbird, two years to do a flight test, two years to do the certification. Usually the company will start engaging the airworthy authority right when they start about the detailed design already. So the typical process for a helicopter is about 10 years from the beginning all the way to it rolled out to deliver the first customer. Typical is about 10 years. As you can see, right after you start a concept, you already start engaging FAA and EASA. Um, eVTOL company, most of the company, 300, they are from startup or entrepreneurs and also from Silicon Valley type. So they're very different than the traditional bricks and mortar Boeing and Airbus. They don't have the background was like traditional aviation or the knowledge how to certify aircraft. So they're very ambitious. So most eVTOL startup, they're trying to reduce this 10 year uh, project plan all the way down to seven years. They all believe they can certify much sooner. And sometimes they make the mistake. They do not engage the airworthy authority until they start doing the flight test or ground vehicle. Then they found out they're a bit late because then the airworthy authority do not know the history, what they're doing, cannot correct some of the mistake and some of the cannot provide advice. So anybody who wants to do an eVTOL new design, I recommend engage the airworthy authority as early as possible. And also do not dream that you can have a certification done in one year. Okay. Uh, in May, uh, let's take a look at the Europe side. May 2020, uh, YASA published an 85-page special condition for VTOL aircraft. I provide a website down there below. I highly recommend anyone who's interested in certifying aircraft get a copy of this PDF. It outlines, address the unique characteristic of how this eVTOL products, and they also describe the airworthiness standard for issuance of a type certificate. It's a very good publication, and uh, Inside this publication, it basically provides a guideline how to go about if you want to engage YASA to certify your eVTOL aircraft. YASA also used a lot of the, um, the previous regulation from the Part 23 and Part 25, and also 27 and 29. What the difference they made is that, okay, anywhere inside those traditional regulation, the word like rotorcraft, or airplane, they said, shall be replaced by VTOL aircraft. Words in there that says engine, turbine, power plant, rotor, shall be replaced by lift thrust unit. All rotation shall be replaced by the word controlled emergency landing. Because most eVTOL aircraft has very small rotor disc, they will not be able to alter rotate. Fuel shall be replaced by energy, because most likely now, you. Is an eVTOL, you'll be using purely electric or a hybrid electric, or it could even be hydrogen. Fuel tank no longer exists. That word will be replaced by energy storage device. And here, let's take a look at so some of the wording from this uh, special condition from the YASA. For example, one of the sections said, eVTOL aircraft shall continue 
find a safe landing after non-catastrophic failure or failures, okay? Example, the lift thrust unit failure, that means the motor or the rotor stop, or it cannot vary the rotor RPM, or the control actuator jams, blade pitch change, and rotor tail and landing gear, all these are considered uh, could be non-catastrophic failure. So what is a catastrophic failure then? Okay, so first we need to understand there's a, the word critical items. Okay, so all the flight critical items must have a less than 10 to the minus nine per hour probability of failure. Okay, so let's take a look on the left side I'm showing a six rotor, uh, the Bell Nexus aircraft. So let's take a look. What happens when the first, if one of the six rotors fails? If the first rotor fails, okay, is that catastrophic? Okay, it's, by definition, you need to design it such that it should not be catastrophic. Means it's not catastrophic, means this, you can continue to fly even with five other rotors. Okay, now you go to the next step. How about second cascading failure? Now you have another rotor. Uh, Fail. So now you have two out of six fail. Now the question is, what is the probability of the second event can happen? Is the second event, the probability is less than 10 to the minus nine, then if that's the case, then you're okay. Because 10 to the minus nine is a threshold. You're less than that, you're safe. If you the probability of the second failure is higher than 10 to the minus nine, then it should not be catastrophic should not means you will be able to continue to fly on four rotors only. In this case, the Bell six rotor is designed to fly on four rotor as long as you don't have two on the one side fail. You have one diagonally across, it's okay, right? So then on the third cascading failure, what have the third rotor fail? Is the probability of that's higher than minus nine or not? So you just go on and on and on. So that's how they want to evaluate. The, uh, the criticality. Now let's take a look as a designer, when we design an EVTO, what are some of the consideration for picking number rotor, four, six, eight, okay. In general, with a helicopter, you have a very big rotor disc. Your light disc loading, less than 10 pounds per square foot. Tilt rotor like the eight or six or nine, very high disc loading, because very small rotor, greater than 20 pounds per square foot. The, the consequence is that, in hover, low disc loading is better, but in four flight, helicopter also has a very low L over D, lift to drag ratio less than four, means they're very high drag and efficient. While more airplane-like vehicle, like the 609 tilt rotor, you have a very high L over D, L over D over eight. That means you fly more like an airplane, you have more better lift, typical, airplane like uh, Boeing 747 has an LRD over 15, okay? So, lower disc loading, bigger rotor, you you give it better hover, but less range because more drag. More airplane-like, you get better cruise and more range, but worse hovering. Less rotor, like a helicopter with one rotor, or you have a quadcopter with four rotor, you have less redundancy. As we start increasing the number of rotors from four to six to eight, more rotor will also give you more redundancy. Okay, so these are some of the issues you will need to consider when you want to design an aircraft. Okay, now do we need to make it more than 10 to the minus nine per flight hour? I mean, do we need to change the rule? Currently, you want to design a commercial aircraft. You need to have any critical items has less than 10 to the minus nine per flight hour. However, let's take a look at the operation. Today, there's zero eVTOL aircraft flying commercially, zero trip per year. By 2025 to 2030, we can expect about 1,000 eVTOL aircraft will start hitting the market, and flying around the world, doing 4 million trips per year. Between 2030 to 2040, I expect there will be 20,000 eVTOL aircraft flying around the world, doing 1 million trips per year. By 2040 and beyond, we can expect 800,000 eVTOL aircraft flying around the world, doing 4 billion trips per year. Now, that is a lot more trips than commercial airline, right? So if you're doing more trips, that means your probability 
to fail is higher. So then should we increase the probability of the bar such that instead of 10 to the minus 9, do we want to make a 10 to the minus 10 and 10 to the minus 11? So that is another consideration that currently being discussed. So now let's see how can we increase the safety, uh, increase the redundancy. So one, we can increase the redundancy and the safety for eVTOL aircraft is use many rotors and motors. Like on the top right, the Volocopter, they use 18 rotors. So now in case one, two, three, four fail, you still can hover and fly safely on the remaining. Or on the bottom left, let's take a look at the Airbus, City Airbus. is a quadcopter, means you have four rotors. However, for each rotor, they use a rotor propeller on the top and one on the bottom. They use a separate electric motor propeller on the top and the bottom. So that also gives you redundancy. Another way to re improve redundancy is safety, stack up multiple motor on one rotor shaft on the top right picture. That was the solution I chose 2010 when I designed my uh, Project Zero eVTOL aircraft. I put two electric motors on the same shaft. In case one motor fail, the second motor will continue to drive. And a third possible solution is inside each motor, you may put multiple winding, two or three or quadruple winding. So in case some of the winding melts or shorted, you still have extra additional winding to turn the motor. Now let's talk about flight control. This is a traditional mechanical flight control on an aircraft. So the pilot would put a joystick, you control it, and then you'll go through bell cranks, pulleys, cables to control all the control surfaces. It's quite reliable because of direct mechanical linkage. And then for bigger aircraft, we cannot just rely on brute force to control the surfaces. We need to use hydraulic. So commercial aircraft like Boeing, Airbus, even like um, Cessna jet, you will use hydraulic. So when the pilot putting his control stick, yes, he's moving some cables, but then the cables and lever are used to control the control valves for the hydraulic cylinder, hydraulic system. Then the hydraulic system will move your control services like the elevator and the aileron. So it, the ideal is very similar to power steering on your car. So this is what a fly-by-wire looks like. So now instead of using mechanical pulleys, cables, bell cranks, and then the drive uh, hydraulic actuator. So now we replace it by wires. So in the front where the pilot has the control stick, his commands from the joystick are changed into wire signal. Electric signal go to a flight control computer. Then the flight control computer and then provide a signal to the control service, either moving hy hydraulic actuator or electric servo. So because now you got rid of all the mechanical linkages. This is called fly-by-wire control system. But we can see the problem with this. If one of the wires se severed, we'll lose control. So if the flight control computer fail, you'll lose control. So what they came up with is we will need to have triple and quad redundancy. So instead of having one flight computer with one processor, we'll put three or four flight computer. So when the pilot put an input, they'll go to all three computers and then all three computer will process it. And then they'll compare to are all the signal the same. So in case one computer fail, let's say processor one fail, you still have two and three. If two and one fail, you still have three left. Okay. So this is how you build the redundancy in a fly-by-wire control system. And then Instead of using hydraulic, now the trend is to go into mechanical actuator called EMA. So it's quite simple in theory. The principle is just an electric motor. So it's driving, uh, turning a, a warm gear uh, threaded screw shaft, and then it's that turn, and then it put it moves the actuator the rod in and out. So that's an EMA in the simplest term. But more advanced design will be actually you have the motor building linearly into your EMA actuator to move it in and out. If we are going to build EV tall aircraft, we will not want to have hydraulic anymore. We want to go to pure electric system. Everything run a battery. So we replace the hydraulic by EMA. Why? Because hydraulic fluid are also highly flammable. 
And why carry hydraulic fluid when we already have the battery? So typical RC airplane and the quad copter we're seeing people flying for hobby, for fun. These are already the simplest term, fly by wire, because they have no mechanicals uh, linkage. Everything is by wire uh, receiver to the servos, right? So EV tall by nature almost have to be fly by wire. Why? Let's take a look on the left side, the quad, the CD Airbus quadcopter. There's no control services on that. Basically, you are controlling the whole vehicle by changing the RPM or pitch angle of the, the four rotor. So you're, you're required to send the, uh, the signal by electricity. And on the right side, on the Fahana, that's a tilt wing aircraft, and they're, you're controlling the yawn, for example, in four flight by varying the, uh, uh, the differential changing the thrust on the different rotor. And the only four flying and you're moving the control services. So your combination on both aircraft, you change, sometimes change the RPM, you could be changing the motor. So that's all electric. So it's basically your fly by wire. Now here is the caveat. So far there in the world, there's been no civil fly by wire rotorcraft certified yet. Rotorcraft means anything with a rotor. The, a, the AW609 should be on the left, actually. I got to reverse on the, the, the nomenclature. It's been trying to certify for 10 years. Still has not been certified yet. The Bell 505 helicopter, after 10 year program, it will soon be certified, but still not yet. So why is it so difficult to receive a civil, civil certification for fly by wire? Because it's never been done yet and also they're totally new. So the FAA want to be extremely short. So if there's no civil certified fly-by-wire rotorcraft yet, so how can we be so sure there'll be eVTOL aircraft certified in the near future with fly-by-wire? Another uh, challenge is autonomous flying. We, have, we heard about many eVTOL companies, they all said we would like this to be fully autonomous, capable of flying with no pilot. However, we'll put a pilot in there just for safety. Let's take a look at what's the nomenclature, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So level zero means basically you're driving your car, for example. You're to control the full thing. And level two means you have some automation, lane change, control automatically. Level three, level four are like today's Tesla. They will have some kind of autonomous driving assisting. A level five for a car or EV tow aircraft is basically you can read a book. You don't, you don't have to do anything. So the holy grail for all the EV tow aircraft and automobile industry is all want to go to level five by this decade. However, due to the public perception, most likely we will not be flying level five this decade because would you want to get an EV tow where there's no human pilot in there? Even though technology will allow us to achieve there, but most likely in the initial phase of the EV tow aircraft, we will have a pilot. Uh, but there is some benefit to doing EV tow aircraft. Helicopter is shown here. This is the gearbox for AW169, uh, one of the helicopter I worked on the previously. The gearbox is so complex on the helicopter. There are thousands of parts, and there's a requirement by the FAA such that if you run the electric transmission fluid inside, you must be able to continue to run dry for at least 30 minutes. That's an extremely challenging requirement. Helicopters don't have this problem because there's no gearbox required. The motor is connected directly to a propeller, easy to vary RPM, few moving parts. There's only two ball bearing, one at the beginning, one at the end of the motor shaft. The 92, 95% thermal efficient. They can do overpower for a few minutes without burning out, low noise, no pollution, low thermal signature, no oxygen to combust. This is why electric has become so popular for EV tow purpose. Crashworthiness. Fire is a big concern for electric vehicle and, and EV tow aircraft. EASA says, you must minimize the hazard to occupants caused by energy storage system to follow an otherwise survivable impact. Assume you crash landed, hard landed, but you don't want to be killed by the battery fire, right? Because uh, so this is one of the ruling they have. Now the question is how you design where to put a battery in the belly, in the rear, 
in the wing. You put a belly, that could be dangerous if an impact on the ground. You put a rear in case you uh, nose into the ground, even though a few G, the heavy battery weighs 1,000 kilograms behind you could come rushing forward and hit you. That could be catastrophic too. So they came up with a requirement called drop test. So you must do a drop test from at least 50 feet altitude or 15.2 meter. You just do this on the tower. This drop test should demonstrate you shall not lead to a fire, leakage of harmful fluid, fume or gases. Any fire leakage, and also it must be contained for at least 15 minutes to allow the passenger to get out. So they're very clear in publishing the, the ruling. For storage, if you put a battery, like I showed in the previous picture in the cabin, you must be able to handle 4G upward, 4, 16G, sideward 8G, downward 20G, rearward 1.5G. You must satisfy all this. If you're going to put adjacent to the cabin, for example, it could be the wing, you must satisfy another different criteria. So these are very clearly defined in special condition by YASA. Another thing, electromagnetic interference will be operating with a very high current, high voltage. So EMI can interfere with flight instrument, communication equipment. We want to design the aircraft to avoid parallel wires in close proximity. Also, as avoid extremely high voltage. For now, 800 volts seem to be acceptable for a couple of reasons. Why? Uh, we want high voltage because uh, power is equal to voltage times current. If the voltage is very low, that means your current is extremely high. That means that you need very thick wire. They become very heavy or they get very hot, the wire. Now, but probably if you use too high voltage, let's say, why don't we use 2,000 volt, 3,000 volt, that will reduce the current. Then you could go into plasma arcing when you have too high a voltage. So all these are concerned when you try to pick the voltage. And today's technology also allow you to go 800 volt for the silicon carbide. So another thing is heat buildup I mentioned. Electric motor inverter can get very hot, 80 to 100 degrees C. How are you going to keep it cool, prevent the structure from get, getting thermal damage? And not a 3,000 kilogram, the 7,000 pound EV though, it consume one to two megawatts of power and hover. A 800 volt, that is over 1,000 amps of current, that's a lot. So if inadequate thickness of power, it can get very hot, it can burn out, it can cause a fire. Now, how are you going to provide the cooling for the motor, inverter, battery, liquid cooling, air cool? So all these are design considerations as the designer we have to think about. Finally, emergency. What happens if we do have some kind of emergency? The designer must decide how do you do thermal shutdown of the inverter and motor at what temperature, right? Do you put in the uh, automatic sensing so you reach 101 degree, it's shut down by itself? But then there's the risk if you shut down the motor to save the motor inverter to prevent the fire. Now you lose power, you lose control. It also crash. Okay. Now you need some fast acting fuse. In case it's a short, how fast can the fuse turn on to shut off the power? Now we will also try to design the aircraft to separate the battery into different module to drive different motor. So that in case one battery packs fail or short has a problem, we can have remaining the other four or five battery to continue to operate the other rotors. Can the aircraft glide? Uh, this is when you want to design your EV to with a wing. So that can become advantageous, you can glide. If you just have a quadcopter or multi-rotor, if the motor fail, you won't be able to glide. Okay, so and also, Many EVDO aircraft, they use the lift thrust rotor motor for flight control, right? Like the multi rotor or like the, the volocopter. So what happened if the motor stopped? That means you will also lose direction of control. So these are all the different considerations. What happened if the motor stops and hover? Do we want to put in ballistic parachute on there? Finally, uh, what other consideration? There's acoustic noise. There's public acceptance. I recently heard there's a word called uh, visual pollution. Do you want to see the your neighborhood? You look up the air. There's so many vehicles flying over your head, right? We need to worry about cybersecurity. Could people hacking and hijack your these autonomous level fly flying EV aircraft and then take it to somewhere else? Recycling lithium battery. 
integrating with other manned aviation on the aircraft. And are we going to allow private ownership? When? 2030, 2035? So these are all the other considerations we want to design, introduce eVTOL aircraft. Thank you very much. If you have questions, you can send me an email and my address below, and you will get a copy of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Thanks, Prof. We uh, yeah, we're quite yeah, pushed for time, time right now, right now. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, we'll just address a couple of the questions that have uh, just been sent in. And uh, the, yeah, are there any other questions? Maybe you can send it through the uh, emails or the through the organizers. Okay, the first question was I think directed at uh, Prof Wang. He, uh, there seemed to be uh, a question on whether the ten to the ninth reliability number applies for part 23 existing conventional aircraft uh yes I, they okay first let me explain that yes for this whole eVTOL aircraft is a still relative very new area okay and traditionally the part 23 is used for smaller aircraft 12,500 pounds and under nine passenger and the over the part 25 is for the bigger aircraft so now let's focus on the the eVTOL uh definitely yes it will follow some of the ruling from the part 23 and from 25 so it will pick out the 10 to the minus 9 portion from the part 25 and apply to it okay and this is where it's very clearly stated already inside the uh the special condition Mike, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm just going to say that there's kind of a floating reliability uh, perimeters. Uh, there may be difference of, of uh, exponential reliability, whether it's avionics or or uh, we call it factor of safety. So so there's some kind of a fluctuating uh, level of safety uh, for it with, that's embedded in the type of design. It also depends on what systems you're looking at as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like vertical or not. Yep. All right. Um, the next question is one um, on the electric existing ex uh, airworthiness standards for electric engines, FAA or EASA or anybody else. Mike? Okay. So there aren't any existing type certificates yet for eVTOL aircraft, but as was pointed out in our presentations, there are special conditions, and those special conditions are public information. Uh, so there are, may be some proprietary information that's not available, but uh, so today there's not any existing type certificates for eVTOL aircraft. Uh, however, you can look for special conditions. And Prof, you may have other comment. No, that is correct. Like I mentioned, right now is uh, is very interesting. Everything sounds like kind of strange. It's a special condition. So basic. So uh, and uh, really, you cannot just. So for eVTOL designing, one challenge of face is that you, if I want to open an eVTOL company design, I cannot just go to my tier one, tier two supplier and say, hey, can I buy one of your electric motor has been already type certified on other aircraft, I can use it. No, today that doesn't exist yet. Hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we'll start seeing all these uh, more eVTOL aircraft get holistically get certified then we'll be able to buy the same motor that was previously being demonstrated or certified on another aircraft and that we can use. But one of the interesting caveat here is that a lot of companies like Jovi and Lilium, a different company, they're developing their own electric motor. And when they certify that their aircraft was their motor, they're not gonna sell it to you. So they may have the motor certified, you may not get it. Right, okay, there's a last question that just popped up. Uh, the request is that what's the perception on safety requirements for blade or roto burst for EV tolls? Um, Prof, you want to have a first go at it and then I'll ask Mike. Yes, actually, uh, I would highly recommend uh, people get the 85 page. There's actually one section specifically inside the 85 page YASA uh, special condition. It described that the uh, uh, um, projectiles either a blade bursting or like uh, even including burst strike uh, during flight. It very described that that such that when such an event projectile happen, it shall not I mean uh, damage or 
disable the aircraft from continuous flying. Okay, so it must be able to continue its mission even after the projectile. Uh, okay, Mike, anything to add to that? Uh, not really. I would just say, though, that in the testing part of it, you need to be mindful of the test cell uh, capabilities and the airflow dynamics. And, and a lot of that uh, that is discussed here are actually proven out within the test cells. Okay. All right. I think we better end the session. So with, with that, let me thank our two eminent speakers, uh, Mike Daniel and James Wang uh, this morning, and um, wish all of you a pleasant day and stay safe, everybody.